Welcome back into the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. Sap, I needed a, a little more time than a day to digest uh, a, a very heartbreaking and frustrating Game 5 loss for my beloved Celtics. Uh, they fall to the Golden State Warriors 104-94. to See, I gave the score in the correct order this time, Sap, after you pointed out that I was always trying to make it seem like the Celtics won games with the playoffs giving the score. <laughs> But uh, they lose by 10. It was not that close. Um, Golden State came out pretty dominant. The Celtics did not respond. Really, the Celtics only had one quarter where they looked competent, and that was the third quarter, strangely enough, which has been owned by Golden State in this series. But um, in Game 5, it was the Celtics who played a fantastic third quarter. But after that, they had no answers in the fourth and they now are down uh, three games to two, facing uh, elimination and, and the, the championship slipping out of their fingers. Um, Sap, same sort of stuff we've been talking about all postseason long, and especially in the series with the Celtics that, that haunted them. Uh, I, I'll let you talk about the specifics to start. But, um, you know, here I am today with the Celtics, uh, you know, now, now have to stave off elimination twice, and I feel... Very frustrated about the whole thing and uh, like opportunities have just been squandered left and right by this team. I sound like a broken record at this point, but it's been this way throughout the entire postseason. It's about turnovers, turnovers and more turnovers in the postseason. When the Celtics turn the ball over 15 or fewer times, they're 14 and two. When they turn it over 16 or more times, they're 0 and 7. In game five, they had 18 turnovers, thus they lost. They also went 21 of 31 from the free throw line. That's 10 misses. That's 67%. And in the fourth quarter alone, Jason Tatum had four air balls. Not from the free throw line. That would have really been breaking news. But from the floor, he had four air balls in the fourth quarter alone. Jet, the Celtics and Jason Tatum have morphed into Russell Westbrook with the turnovers and the poor shooting and poor free throw shooting and inefficient offense. It's been very, very frustrating. And just to think back to game four, with five minutes and 18 seconds left in game four, the Celtics are up two games to one. They've got a four-point lead at TD Garden. They look to be in control of that series, right? Even though Steph Curry had a monumental game, the Celtics were in really good shape to win game four and go up three games to one. Well, over the final five minutes and 18 seconds, you get outscored 17 to three. Now the series is tied. And then in game five, even though they stunk for the first half, they were able to create a five-point lead midway through the third quarter. And, heck, with 355 left in the third quarter, they're up four. Well, from that point forward to the first three minutes of the fourth quarter, again, a seven-minute stretch, they're outscored 21-6. to six. They've had two awful meltdown stretches in this series. Again, the final 518 in game four where they're outscored 17-3 to three and a seven-minute stretch the end of the third quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter in game five where they're outscored 21-6. to six. And that's the difference right now in Golden State's in control of the series. And I don't feel really confident about this, but I would feel confident the Celtics can find a way to win game six, end up in game seven in Golden State, where, again, Golden State has lost a game seven in the past. Now, it was, you know, six years ago to LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers, but game sevens can be a toss up uh, because all you need is an off night shooting from Steph Curry, foul trouble from Clay Thompson, whatever the case may be, you have a chance, but they got to get through game six before they get to game seven, obviously. Yeah, and you had that off night from Steph Curry in game five, and that's part of why it's even more why it's frustrating, Sap. You know, 7 of 22 from the floor, 0 of 9 from three. I, I think it broke a streak of 230-some-odd games consecutive that Steph Curry had hit a three, which was obviously an NBA record. Um, and yet you lost that game. I mean, how is that possible? Well, Andrew Wiggins outplayed your two stars, um, 26 rebounds, which – he had a career high already at halftime in points uh, in playoff career high, I should say. And he had 13 rebounds. So you let Andrew Wiggins outplay Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. You can't have that. And then you have guys off the bench, Jordan Poole, uh, 14 points. We know all know about this is second buzzer beater, you know, heave uh, Gary Payton, the second 15 points off the bench. Meanwhile, the Celtics bench got virtually nothing, you know, three points out of, uh, out of Grant Williams, one point out of Derek White, no points out of Peyton Pritchard. Um, so, th- you know, no, none of the Celtics role players didn't step up. Um, and, you know, obviously 18 turnovers, as you alluded to, Sap. That's horrible. The free throws are horrible. They, you know, they seem overwhelmed by the moment, Sap. Um, and 
it's it's frustrating because it's a team that's that's now won two game sevens on the road here uh, on the road to this this uh this finals one of those was on the road in miami um and one was against the defending champion milwaukee bucks so you're like how could they be afraid of the moment but every time that the the pressure is really on them and the the stage seems to be the the brightest they seem to wilt and they seem to not know what they're doing and that's really frustrating and i think the free throw shooting's part of that is i think it's nerves and they're clanking free throws and then that sort of snowballs on you once they start missing they compound that by missing more cuz they're really thinking about it um at the end of games they don't seem to know who they want the ball to go to, what they want to do. They, they take a lot of threes at the end of games for God knows what reason. And they, their arms are heavy and they're clanking those left and right. So, you know, I do think that they, they seem like the moment's too big for them right now. And obviously they can, they're still capable of winning. It's not a, it wouldn't be a Herculean task to win two games in a row here against a team that you and I both think they have more, they're more talented than, but golden state, seems a lot more composed because they have been here many times before the Celtics haven't been here at all. And, you know, if I'm looking at what the Celtics lack and what golden state has, it's that sort of veteran leadership that's been able to calm the team down. Like, like in that third quarter sap, when things got out out of control to be able to rally the team around and, and, you know, come back from and not completely panic and, and melt like the Celtics have. And uh, you, you saw that happen earlier in the series too, like you, you said in the, in the prior game. So I, I, I think that the Celtics' problems are, are are not from a skill standpoint; it's an emotional standpoint. Well, I also think that if you look at this, that Golden State's better than Milwaukee and Miami. Um, they're pretty equal to them defensively. They do it a little bit differently. They don't have the rim protector like Giannis or Brooke Lopez like Milwaukee has. They may not have as much physical toughness as Miami, but they're still a really good defensive team. And the difference is, is they make you pay for your turnovers, which Miami and Milwaukee didn't make you pay as much. This stat comes from J.J. Redick, who I really enjoy listening to because he gets into the nitty-gritty the numbers, the analytics, and and they're so interesting. The Warriors have forced 45 live ball turnovers in this series, resulting in 66 points. The Celtics have forced only 27 live ball turnovers, resulting in 42 points. The difference in this series is 24 points. Those are the 24 points off of live ball turnovers. And again, there's different types of turnovers. Dead ball turnover, Jason Tatum sends a pass into the seventh row. Okay, you could kind of recover from that because by the time they retrieve the ball, you go back on defense, you set up, and now you've got equal footing there. Jason Tatum throws a pass to Steph Curry. Next thing you know, within three seconds, Golden State's at the other end of the court and Steph's setting up for an open three or Clay Thompson's stepping up for an open three or Andrew Wiggins is dunking at the rim. And now, you know, it's points for Golden State. So that's been a huge difference. Again, the Warriors have forced 45 live ball turnovers, resulting in 66 points. The Celtics have forced only 27 live ball turnovers resulting in 42 points. That's a huge difference. And also the inconsistency of the Celtics in this series, Jed. In their two wins, they scored 120 and 116 points. That's awesome, right? You're going to win scoring that type of, uh, with that type of arsenal. In their three losses, it's been 88, 97, 94. You know, like very poor offensive performances. Thus you lose. Look at Golden State's offense in this, in this series in five games. 108, 107, 100. 107, 104, just consistent. They're more consistent. The more I watch this series, Jet, I get the feeling that the Warriors are kind of like the Patriots in 2018. They may not be the best team, but they have so much championship DNA that they're going to find a way to beat the Kansas City Chiefs and the L.A. Rams, who might be more talented, but just not ready for the shining moment. I hope I'm wrong on that and the Celtics come back and win game six and force this to game seven. But you just see that consistency with Golden State, like you alluded. When things go off the rails for Golden State, they kind of write the ship just enough to get back on track and then win the game where the Celtics, when it goes bad, it goes really bad. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's a that's a good comparison, Seth, to the Patriots in, in another regard, too, in that what we talked about with the whole with the Patriots dynasty for years is that you you can't make mistakes against them. They're not going to let you you just get away with you know oh we're going to go for it in fourth down in our own territory here and oh we, if we don't get it then the Patriots are going to score period 
uh, or if you kick field goals instead of trying to, you know, really push the pace and, and, and go and, you know, get a touchdown, you're going to lose. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the Celtics um, have, have made a ton of mistakes, obviously, and the Warriors are a team that makes you pay for it, period. Um, and a, a lot of that, too, is, is the maturity of being able to know what the moment is and say we've been here a million times before. This isn't new territory for us, so they, they feel comfortable. Um, and the Celtics obviously have it, Sap. And, and, and you know, you, you, you look at the turnovers, you look at the first play of the game, Sap. Celtics, Jason Tatum, turned the ball over, unforced error. It's the unforced ones that kill you, Sap. Um, the, mm-hmm. the ones where they just look lazy. And the Celtics, in a game that was just so important where you're like, they really need to win this game or at least be, you know, come out with, I thought they were going to come out and be super competitive. I thought the way the game was going to go is the Celtics get off to a big lead and Golden State chips away and chips away. Instead, the Celtics came out, I mean, as flat and as lazy and tired as you could possibly be. 16 points in the first quarter, Sap. I mean, with with all those those guys, you know, weapons on offense, how do you, amount to 16 points in a quarter. I mean, that's terrible. Um, and, and Jason Tatum's final stat line sap looks pretty good. You know, 10 of 20 from the floor, five of nine from three, 10 rebounds, four assists, 27 points. But at when it mattered the most, he, he didn't do anything in the fourth quarter. Um, and, and, and that that's incredibly frustrating. And Jalen Brown uh, had a bad game. I mean, five of 18 from the floor, not efficient at all. Um, Al Horford since game one has really been kind of a ghost offensively. Grant Williams has given you nothing. Peyton Pritchard's given you nothing. Derek White has been pretty good, but last game he gave you nothing. So other guys aren't stepping up. We know what the case is with Rob Williams. He's, he's playing at 30, 40%. He's still been effective, but in spurts, you can't ask him to do that much. In fact, he played 30 minutes. It's probably more than he's capable of playing. Um, considering his injuries. And so it's at the end of the day, Sap, it's on Tatum and Brown to be able to step up and play superb superstar basketball. And they have not done that consistently. They haven't really done that at all. And so the Celtics are finding themselves in a three, two hole and, and the, with the possibility of the Warriors tomorrow night celebrating in Boston um, because the Celtics have had opportunities and they have not been able to seize them. This is, this was the third game Sap in this series that the Celtics had had a, chance to take a really commanding lead in this series and put their foot on the throat of the golden state warriors game two they had the opportunity they blew that one game four they had the opportunity to go up three one they blew that one game five they had the opportunity to win and potentially try to close things out on their home court and they blew that one you know three massive games three losses and uh i think the celtics their body language was bad towards the end of last game they just looked like they're like, we should be winning this series. Why aren't we winning? We're better than this team. They look sort of lost. You can kind of look at this series and either team could say, we could have swept the opposition, right? I mean, because other than game three, the other four games were back and forth in a sense of each team had an opportunity to win and they just couldn't seal the deal. So here we are. And this goes back to my initial point before the series. These are both very good teams, not great teams. You're not going to get, you know, a sweep, certainly. And now we're going to game six and maybe we go to game seven. And you look at Jason Tatum, he's going to catch a lot of heat for the way he's performed in this series. And deservedly so. He hasn't stepped up the way you would like him to step up. His stat line was good the other night, but there was a stretch when he reached 22 points and he was stuck on 22. I mean, you know, if he'd been playing blackjack, uh, he would have lost by, you know, one one point on the hand. But he was stuck right. on 22, which felt like 45 minutes in real time, right? He got off to a great start in the third quarter. You take the lead, and then he just disappeared till it was garbage time. Here's the thing about Jason Tatum. In the series so far, he's 5 of 21 in the fourth quarter. That's 24%. That's abysmal. The other thing is in the final five minutes of the five fourth quarters in this series, Luke Cornett has five points. Luke Cornett, five points in the final five minutes of the five games in this series so far. Jason Tatum has three. So Luke Cornett's been more productive in the final five minutes of each of these games than Jason Tatum. I'm not making that up. It's not a joke. It's not something out of the onion. It's the facts, and that's not good for this Boston Celtics. Tatum has to be better during winning time than he has been so far in this series. Yeah, that's horrible, and it's it's – it, the, the crazy thing about it too, Seth, is that 
uh, it's not like he's a bad fourth quarter player. He's been a very good fourth quarter player and, and, and had in other postseason series and throughout his career, he's been a, a good fourth quarter player. And I don't know if, you know, the shoulders bothering him, which, you know, his, he shot efficiently from the floor. He didn't shoot well from the free throw line, but so you're like, well, is the shoulder actually bothering him or is he fatigued? Well, what the hell is going on? I, you know, there's a lot of questions. I think it's fair to criticize him for how he's played in this in this uh, finals because it has not been good. It's not been the level that you expect out of Jason Tatum. And I know he's young and this is his first finals, but they are here. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not fiction. They are in the NBA finals. And it, for a large reason, it's because of the play of Jason Tatum. Um, and he has not lived up to his end of the bargain in this series a, at all. Um, and and Jalen Brown has been up and down as he is. And you know, the rest of the role players, that's what their role players are reason. So they're going to be up and down, but you need the consistency out of Jason Tatum and you haven't gotten that at all. Um, and, uh, and you need more consistency out of Jalen Brown too. And I know they're both young. And so it's, it's a lot to ask, but you are at this point for a reason. And so I, I think that it, it, it's not, it's not unreasonable to ask for the consistency no. from your star players. So not at all, because I, I look at this and say, okay, Tatum's in his fifth year. Jalen Brown's in his sixth year. Seven of the eight rotational players are 28 and younger. That's all well and good. And, and Celtic fans will say, well, if they lose this, they'll be back next year. Well, yeah, not I necessarily. Hate that. That it's just the not the right narrative. It does because let's go back a decade ago when Oklahoma city lost to LeBron and the heat in five games in the 2012 NBA finals, if you were in Oklahoma City, you would say, well, we've got Kevin Durant. He's the best scorer in the game. we got Russell Westbrook, who's, you know, on the precipice of averaging a triple-double. Oh, and we've got James Harden, although we're going to trade him in the offseason because we can't afford him. But we still got Durant and Westbrook. We'll get back to the finals, right? No, they never got back to the finals. Or if you want to have a cross-board reference, Dan Marino wins an MVP in his second year in the league, sets records, gets to the Super Bowl, and never goes back again. My favorite football player of all time, Aaron Rodgers, third year as a starter, wins the goddamn Super Bowl. Since then, he's won four league MVPs and has never gotten back to the Super Bowl. So you can't just look at that and say, well, they'll be back there next year because they're young. They'll, they'll figure it all out. You've got teams in the East that are only going to get better last year. You know, Chris Middleton should be healthy in the postseason next year. Milwaukee will be a factor. We know that Brooklyn at some point might figure it out. Philadelphia might figure it out. You know, the Miami will add another piece and, and contend at some point. So you've got to take advantage of that situation right now. It's there for you. And I just don't know if these guys are quite ready yet. And they're facing a team that's not going to shoot itself in the foot. You talked about that when the teams played the Patriots, they'd walk off the field going, damn, we're better than them, but how did we lose? Well, you didn't play as good a situational football as the Patriots. And that's kind of the case here in this series situational basketball look Jordan Poole who you know had a nice game the other night he had uh, 14 points Gary Payton the second had 15 points those guys scored 29 points in 40 minutes your top two reserves Derek White and Williams had what four points in 37 four. minutes that's yeah, a, an enormous difference and Jordan Poole's hit two long distance threes at the buzzer of the third quarter in two games now maybe that's luck but that's also situational basketball. When he banked in that three at the end of the third quarter in game five, you kind of got a sense that, oh, that was a backbreaker. And you know what? The Celtics screwed that up. You, you can't leave people wide open. NBA shooters who are, you know, the best in the world at this, even if it's a lucky shot, you know, Grant Williams at that point was kind of just walking around the court, not knowing what to do. His head's up his ass. And here's Jordan Poole. I know it's a lucky shot, but don't even give him the opportunity to take that shot. Kind of contest it somewhat. Don't foul him. That's Absolutely. The dumbest thing and, you, you know, do. part of, part of that too, Seb, is, you know, they're so frustrated with the re officiating, which has been yes. bad. The officiating has been bad. No one's going to argue yeah, that. But, it's not been but great for either minute. side. I'm not saying it. No, it's, but it hasn't. Okay. I, I know people are saying this. The Celtics, the Golden State got called for 12 more fouls than the Celtics. No, I'm not the other saying night. it's been skewed one way or the other. I'm just saying okay, it's been bad. Everybody, everybody, it's been bad, but if it's been worse for the other team, why complain, right? I mean, no, I, Celtics, I, I agree with you, yeah. Sep. I'm just saying they're frustrated because they, they think the, the quality is poor, well, which they're not. Hope wrong. Grant, the quality is no, but, poor, but you got to get – Golden State's not bitching about well, I mean, a little bit. Let's hope – is Grant, is Grant Williams bitching because a call went against Golden State? I hope not. I hope he's not that, you know – Deranged. No, I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I, I just, they complain way too much, and Udoka knows oh, they course. do, and yeah. you know he's trying to to lobby for them because he doesn't want those his guys to be frustrated, so he's picking up a tech, which I have no problem sure. with him doing. And I think I, the, the guy who I think is blameless throughout this is Udoka. I think has still done a phenomenal job coaching. Like 
I don't know what the hell more you, you can ask of the guy uh, in, in terms of, you know, I think he, he's, he's done everything that to get the team to this point. And it's, it's on the players right now. I, and I, and whenever I listen to him wired up or his pre or post game interviews, he says all the right things. You know, it's not the things that Brad Stevens was saying that were so vague, like Udoka's pointing like here, here, and here, this is where we screwed up and didn't play well. I like that. I really like that. Um, but the players are complaining about the officiating so much to the point where they're not playing defense. They're getting distracted mm-hmm. and, and, and golden state's obviously going to take advantage of that sap. And also, I think there's like this is this is not the first year I, I've said this, and I, I think it's, it's it's maintained this year. There's like an arrogance about this team for that has accomplished nothing. There was an arrogance <laughs> about them for getting to the Eastern Conference Finals a couple of years in a row, and there's been an arrogance about this team, like about the Warriors. It's like, oh, Andrew Wiggins, like, yeah, okay, we're not gonna guard, yeah, whatever, you know, Andrew Wiggins, we're not gonna pay too much attention to you. You're not Steph Curry, and we're not we're too worried about it. Uh, Clay Thompson, he's not really what he was before. Draymond Green hasn't played well. We're we're just going to give him a wide open lane to the basket. It's like they think that that because they are more talented than Golden State, Golden State should sort of just like acquiesce and and you know if the Celtics are going to give them open shots, miss the shots, and let the Celtics do whatever they want to. I mean, they, they, I, I, Andrew Wiggins played great. I'm not taking anything away from him, but the Celtics did not play competitive defense on Andrew Wiggins. Well, Andrew Wiggins in the last two games has scored 43 points and had 29 rebounds. This is a guy who's a career, what, six rebound per game guy. I mean, his career high before game four of the finals, both regular season and playoffs, was 11. And he's come back and had 16 in game four, 13 in game five. He was clearly the best player on the floor in game five. He's done a really good job defensively against Jason Tatum. He was the first pick in the draft. Again, maybe overdrafted when you look back at the 2014 draft. And Bede should have been the first pick, but he had back issues. So teams kind of had a red flag on him. So they went with Wiggins. Minnesota did. And look, it's it's kind of interesting that Wiggins could be the third guy that leaves Minnesota and wins a championship with another team, right? Garnett yep. did it with the Celtics. Kevin Love did it with Cleveland. And maybe Andrew Wiggins is going to do it here with Golden State. So, you know, leaving Minnesota is a a good idea for players. Uh, maybe Carl Anthony Towns is the next one. Maybe Sap. As an as an aside, you know, there's a story, and I'm sure we'll talk about probably the offseason that all these these um, other teams, the owners and GMs, are pissed at the Warriors because the Warriors are you know paying so much in luxury tax and going to continue to pay more because they're going to you know resign all these guys. Um, they're like, you know, it's not fair. Whatever. Well, if you don't have dumbass teams like the Minnesota Timberwolves trading them Andrew Wiggins. And two high lottery picks for D'Angelo Russell, which at the time everybody besides the, the Timberwolves knew was an idiotic trade. Then you don't have this problem. It's the same thing mm-hmm. as like with like again with the Patriots. Like, oh yeah, here's Randy Moss. We're just gonna trade him to you. Like, like what? Why are you giving? Why are you helping out these these guys? And so that trade really I, I knew at the time was going to work out for Golden State because it was a perfect situation for Andrew Wiggins. Andrew Wiggins is a better basketball player than D'Angelo Russell. I know yes. D'Angelo Russell was the number two pick. He's made an all-star team now. Now, so has Andrew Wiggins. But Andrew Wiggins fits better into this. And, th- and then for their troubles, they gave him two lottery picks, Sap. It's like, if you don't have these itty, idiot teams like the Timberwolves, you're, you're, then the Warriors are, you know, probably don't get to the finals with Andrew Wiggins. They don't have the ability to sign all these good guys because you, you, you're helping out the team that does not need help. So that's just a quick rant about me being frustrated with this no, stupid I'm, Minnesota Timberwolves. I'm with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, Joe Lakeup and the Golden State Warriors, they create a lot of money. They built this beautiful new arena in San Francisco. You know, right now they're there with the Knicks and the Lakers and the Celtics as the four most valuable franchises in the NBA, and they spend money. Wouldn't you want to be a fan of the Golden State Warriors? If I'm a fan of the Golden State Warriors, I couldn't care less if, if Joe Lakeup and the owners are paying, you know, an exorbitant amount of money with the luxury tax, I, from what I understand, their payroll is $345 million because of the luxury tax. And it's nice to have a player like Andrew Wiggins, who is your, well, technically your fourth best player, although he's been your second best player in this series behind only Steph Curry, but in the pecking order, obviously Curry Thompson, Draymond green, and then Andrew Wiggins. And you know, what makes golden state scary. And I don't want to, you know, we won't get into this too much right now because they still haven't won the championship yet. And there's a long off season that we can talk about this. They have three young players, James Weissman, Kuminga, and Moody. Yep. That's their future. That's that's kind of scary, right? They have these three young guys that look like they're all going to be 
really good players. So that Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, and Andrew Wiggins now will have even more coming out in the next couple of years, not to mention Jordan Poole. They draft and develop players well. It's not that they just went out. I know when they signed Durant, that was just not even fair. But they've kind of reinvented themselves now by getting an Andrew Wiggins, by drafting well and developing Absolutely, players. Absolutely, Seth. And these dumbass teams that are complaining about it. Hey, you had an opportunity to draft Steph Curry, you idiots. And, you know, they didn't. They had the opportunity to draft Clay Thompson. He wasn't a very high pick. Didn't. Draymond Green, second round pick. They didn't draft him. Uh, everybody, people mocked them when they drafted Jordan Poole. Gary Payton's been on 30 teams, you know, right. between the G League and Europe and China and the United States. You, none of you could figure out how to get this guy to, to be a viable NBA player. He's playing 26 minutes in the finals and scoring 15 points. Uh, I, I'm sorry, but these teams should have nothing to complain about. The Durant thing, complain about that. That That is valid. This stuff. You know, they have a bunch of good players because they've drafted and developed. Well, other teams have had the chance to draft, develop, or sign some of these guys, and they've passed on it. So shame on you. Jet, the Timberwolves had two chances to draft Steph Curry. Instead, they took Ricky Rubio and Johnny Flynn, both point guards, by the way. They wanted to draft a point guard, and they decided to go with Ricky Rubio, which I understand because if Rubio had stayed healthy, you know, he was an all-star caliber player. He's not Steph Curry. And then Johnny Flynn, who was – you know, obviously not Steph Curry either, but they had two chances to draft it, Steph Curry. The the Warriors should give the Timberwolves rings, you know, for all these championships they've won too, well, because between, between you know, the Steph Curry passing on him twice. So give the Timberwolves, thank you, Minnesota Timberwolves. And now if they win with this one, the, the Andrew Wiggins trade set was just idiotic. Idiotic. I mean, I, I don't know how you can look at it any other way. It was, it was so stupid. The Timberwolves were so desperate to get D'Angelo Russell because he was friends with Carl Anthony Towns that they, you know, what should have been just a swap of Wiggins for for Russell. I think everybody would have been like, yeah, whatever, that's fine. They're like, yeah, take a couple of lottery picks too. That'll, that'll really sweeten the pot. I'm sure Golden State was like, uh, sure, yeah, why not? Golden State can send the Timberwolves rings for Andrew Wiggins – and Steph Curry, but the Celtics have to send rings to Minnesota for Kevin Garnett. So Minnesota is impacted, you know, multiple finals here. And oh, by the way, they also traded Kevin Love for Andrew Wiggins. And right. Kevin Love was, you know, a pretty important part in the 2016 championship team in Cleveland. So Minnesota's turned into the uh, farm the team. Kingmaker. Championship the teams. Kingmakers. Yes. Yeah. Maybe we should change um, their name to the Minnesota Kingmakers. They should. Jeez. That's got to be frustrating as a Timberwolves fan, you know, a team that's had virtually no success. They've made one conference finals in their in their NBA uh, lives. That's the extent of it. And here that, you know, they're trading all their good players and helping other teams win championships. Maybe maybe the Celtics rally set. And, and, you know, we don't have to talk about the dumbass Andrew Wiggins trade anymore. Um, But. It, it, it has been frustrating, Sap. Like I said, three op- three great opportunities in this series uh, to really put your stamp on it and put pressure on the Warriors. You lost all three of those games. You've now lost consecutive games for the first time in the postseason, the, really the first time since January, other than the game they lost to the Raptors where they didn't play any of their starters. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm wondering about in game six where the Celtics' heads are at after – Knowing that they've had these great opportunities and not played well in those games and squandered them, knowing that what was hurting you going into game five turnovers, missed free throws, that sort of stuff, not playing well in the fourth quarter at the end of fourth quarters and not being able to reverse those those trends and then losing a game, a consecutive games for the first time in a while. Where do you think they are in terms of where their heads are at sap heading into this this game six? Well, if we're looking at the past and they lost a really heartbreaking game, game five against Milwaukee, which gave the Bucs a 3-2 lead and you were going to Milwaukee for game six. And most people felt that the season was going to end that night. And Jason Tatum had 46 points. I didn't. I felt comfortable because I thought the Celtics were better than Milwaukee. And it turned out to be the case as they won game six and then they won game seven in blowout fashion. And then they had a really difficult loss in game six against Miami when they could have wrapped things up at TD garden, got a little extra rest going into the finals. Instead, they didn't show up that night. They made a little bit of a comeback, ended up losing. And then you needed to go to Miami for game seven and you won there. So when they've screwed up, they've normally bounced back. My concern here though, is they screwed up at the end of game four. So you would think in game five, they'd be ready to play and come out blazing instead they scored 16 points in the first quarter of game five. So it, it felt like 
what happened at the end of game four really lingered into game five. Now, hopefully for the Celtics, what happens happened in game five doesn't linger into game six or else Golden State's going to wrap this thing up. The difference between Milwaukee and Miami compared to Golden State is with Milwaukee, it was Giannis and maybe a little bit of Drew Holiday. With Miami, it was Jimmy Butler and Lord knows who. With Golden State, they just proved the other night Steph Curry can have an off-night shooting and they still can break 100 points and beat you because other guys step up. Look, Clay Thompson looks closer to Clay Thompson the last three games, right? Yes. Averaging 21 a game the last three games, hitting 40% of his threes. Draymond Green played a sneaky good game in, in game five. Not great, but nine points, eight rebounds, six assists. You know what Draymond Green does. Poole and Peyton both had really nice games. Andrew Wiggins was the best player on the floor with 26 and 13. They just have more ways to beat you, which kind of leads me back into this whole thing. And I, I kind of said this during the Miami series. Before this series, we were both in agreement that the Celtics were more talented. I don't know anymore if that's the case, right? I mean, if, what we'll do is after the series is over, maybe we'll do a draft like we yeah. did before the series. And, you know, Andrew Wiggins might not be the seventh guy drafted like he was before the series. He might go number one. <laughs> he might go number one or number two. I mean, he's outplayed Jason Tatum in the series, especially in games four and five. Well, I think, Sap, it, it'd be worth it to do two exercises, a, a draft and then a, a rank, a power ranking of how they played in this in this finals. Because if you're power ranking mm -hmm. the guys and how they played in the finals, and obviously there's still game or games left to be played, so that can change. Steph Curry... Number one, I, yep. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Probably Andrew Wiggins, number two, right? In terms of power rankings, right. the guys who have, yep. in terms of how good they've been in, in this in this finals, I, I sure. think that that's that's a reasonable way to do it. So you can we can look at it both ways. And you know, I I have the tendency, and I was texting you about this too, to be like, this is what the Celtics are missing. This is what they are lacking. This is what they need to do in the postseason. And I don't want to you know start getting into that yet until you know the Celtics actually kick the bucket here or, or win a championship. Um, hopefully it's, it's the latter. Um, and, and, but, you know, I, I do think that there are, there have become some, some roster issues, um, whether it's, 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 you know, uh, specialists or more veterans um, that have kind of creeped up in this finals that the Celtics lack, you know, I think that you have, one true, you know, veteran, veteran in Al Horford, uh, Marcus Smart a little bit, and, but Marcus Smart hasn't really been here before. You know, Al Horford's had a long career. So the guys that bring out the bench, Sap, you know, Grant Williams, this is his third year. Uh, Pritchard, this is his second year. Um, Derek White, you know, has only been on the Celtics for half a season. So I, I think that they've had a little bit of roster problems that have, have creeped up in the finals, but Maybe, maybe, you know, those guys step up in game six and game seven, and I'm proven completely wrong. You look at the 2008 championship team, and that was a, a better team in a sense that you had Garnett, Pierce, and Allen. And that those guys wagon. might have been, that was a wagon. And they, those guys, those three may have been a little bit past their prime, but they also had Kendrick Perkins, who did his job to the highest level, you know, playing defense, rim protecting, setting picks, being kind of like the offensive lineman of that team. And you had Rondo in his second year emerging, but you also had guys like Eddie House and James Posey coming off Tony the bench. Allen. Yeah. Tony Allen. I mean, Posey Leon and House Poe, had already they won. were loaded, loaded team. Posey and House had already won championships. So like they, these guys had that DNA. The, the Celtics have none of that. None of the Celtics have, have ever played in the NBA finals. I mean, Ime Adoka was an assistant coach with San Antonio. That's about it. And that's as an assistant coach. So you need, you know, maybe, you, again, that's all for the offseason roster reconstruction, those types of things of, of getting guys that, you know, have been there. And it, and it can help because they, again, the situational basketball, that's what they're really poor at at this point. You know, it, it, it kind of really, we see it at the end of quarters. That, that's been a problem all year. The end of quarters where like, Geez, they got outscored 8-2 in the final minute and a half. So yeah, instead not closing of a 12, out well. Without having a 12-point lead, now it's down to six. You know, that type of thing is, is just not good. Yeah, that's, you know, that's something that you talk about in a high school basketball, middle school basketball, is you got to close out quarters, right? Uh, right. Because it's a momentum thing. And and the Celtics did, you, you alluded to this a, a minute ago, Sap, the Celtics did have the lead, the take the lead in the third quarter. And then Jordan Poole, you know, it launches a, a deep three that the Celtics didn't play defense on. And then suddenly Golden State has the lead going in the fourth quarter. So it's like, I think from a from a emotional standpoint and just looking up the scoreboard standpoint, you're like, we just did all that work. We played so well. We don't even have the lead. So and then Golden State, I think, started with an eight 
11-0 run to start the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, the Celtics based on their shooting right now, eight points seems like 30 points. This game is over. Um, they just starting quarters and finishing quarters. So important. And the Celtics have not been consistent in, in any aspect of doing that. So uh, the, but the biggest thing, frustrating thing for me, Sap, is that they know this. They know the turnovers are hurting them. They know the free throw shooting is hurting them. They know the starting, the finishing quarters is hurting them. And yet they have not been able to improve it. So uh, you kind of throw up your hands and are like, how in the first play of the game in game five, that's an incredibly important game. After three straight days of hearing turnovers are going to really affect this game. You can't turn the ball, can't turn the ball over, can't turn the ball over. Jason Tatum turns the ball over the first play of the game. You're like, what the hell, you know, to use a nicer term. Uh, it's so it's just like, it's so frustrating, Sap. I mean, first play of the game, they turn the ball over. It's like, are, are they paying attention at all to what's killing them in this series? So from my Celtics fan perspective, Sap, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm emotionally fried. Well, get some rest, you know, <laughs> uh, hydrate. That's also important. Um, yeah. And make sure your potassium level's high so that you can get through these games. That's what I would tell the fans and the players, obviously. But, yeah, I mean, I, I also think that when you get in these situations, your team follows your best player. And, and we're all in agreement Jason Tatum's their best player. And – if he's playing tight, then I think the rest of the team starts to play tight. He's turning yeah. the ball over, and it has a way of trickling down to even the role players. So, you know, he's got to come out in the first quarter in game six and and be forceful, get to the basket, uh, play with that force, and that should open up things for the rest of the offense. The other thing about their offense, which has just been hit or miss in this series, I mean, I detailed it with the scores, 120 and 116 in the two wins, 88, 97, and 94 in the three losses. There's, like, no consistency there is make simple passes, right? So if if the idea is to go from point A to point C, make sure that you go to point B. So there's nothing wrong with that hockey assist. You don't have to make the difficult pass to get the assist. Make the easy pass and let the next player make the pass that leads to the basket. That's just, that's really simple stuff, but it's it's so important. When they're oh, that's clicking a great on all cylinders, that's when they're working. You know, Tatum will get it to Brown, who then will make the nice pass to Marcus Smart or whatever order you want to talk about. And also I'd like to see a little bit more two-man game with Tatum and Brown. Go with your two best players. Let's have some action with those two guys because they did that earlier in the postseason and it worked. They seem to get away from it. It seems like when they really look for a bucket, it's mostly Tatum and Smart. Why not Tatum and Brown? Go with your two best players. Absolutely. And you'd like to see Brown and Tatum both hot in the same quarter. You know, they both right. – uh, where the team's like, okay, which one do we defend on this position? And said the Celtics like, okay, fourth quarter, this is going to be, and then they, you know, they flip a coin. Okay, Brown, we're going to just run the offense through you in this quarter. Or the third quarter, okay, Tatum, you. It's like, why not both of them? But I, I think you made a great point too, Sap, about the hockey assist too, in that I was watching you know game as I do with, with my dad. I watch all these games with him. And I was like, oh, why are they making these passes so much harder than they have to be? Even the ones that don't result in turnovers. It's like Marcus smart from half court. will try to throw an entry pass to the, you know, to the baseline with, with uh, Al Horford or Rob Williams is in double covered. Sometimes, you know, they'll catch you like, why, why are you making this incredibly difficult pass for no reason? If you really want to get to Rob Williams, you know, dribble it up, pass it to another guy. He could find Rob Williams. You don't have to force it into him. And like Jason Tatum's throwing cross court passes to, and they're getting obviously intercepted. It's like wh- you want to get the ball to point C, like you said, Sap, like why do you have to do it in one play? It's it's mm-hmm. they, they do have this tendency with the passing. And then when they're down to try to just hit home runs every single time, you're like, you don't have to do that. You can hit singles, you know, get on base to use baseball analogies. Like you don't have to get it all back or get to make the, the get the ball to the guy that you need. You want to get the guy at this second. It's like they, they have this weird thing where they panic and then they, it just leads to golden state getting easy baskets virtually every single time. So I think it, it's it, a great point. It looks even worse because of the team you're playing. Who's a really good defensive team. Golden state was number two in the league in defense this year behind the Celtics. I think the biggest misconception of the Warriors is they're not a good defensive team. They've always been a good defensive team. They're well coached. You know, Draymond Green's an elite defender. Clay Thompson, he's not what he used to be, but he still knows what he's doing out there. And even though Steph is a liability at times, he always seems to be in the right place at the right time. So, you know, loose balls tend to find him. And the rest of those guys will play defense. We see Wiggins is developing into a really good defensive player. But 
the lack of ball movement on the Celtics end when they have the ball is really pronounced when you go to the other end and see what Golden State does. Because nobody in the league comes even close to moving the ball like Golden State does. Like I said, it, it almost feels like they are the Brazilian soccer team when they were loaded, you know, when they played the beautiful game and they were winning World Cups. It was just a really pleasing thing to watch. And the Celtics at times feel more like, you know, Italy or Germany, Germany, very systematic and, and you know, more regimented, whereas Gold State just got this beautiful free flowing offense. And next thing you know, you get wide open shots. The Celtics have to get to that at some point if they have a chance to win this sixth game and then ultimately force that seventh game. Yeah, and you see at times the Celtics offense can look like that, and they do move mm-hmm. the ball beautifully. And then other times it's like just completely isolation. Um, and you know something else that I before we kind of go into our predictions for Game Six here, Seth, that you talked about the Golden State very good defensively, but they don't have a rim protector. Is that the Celtics don't attack the basket enough? And and something that I noticed in, in the last game when they were making their run in the third quarter. Golden State was in foul trouble. There's seven minutes left. The Celtics were in the bonus. I think they only took two free throw shots the rest of the way. Like you can't, you can't do that. If you have, you have seven minutes of bonus time, you need to be attacking constantly. If you're in the bonus and there's seven minutes left and you're taking three pointers, you're bailing Golden State out every single time. Mm -hmm. You need to be taking a lot of free throws that that is. And the Celtics could have built a more substantial lead that way. Instead, they they went away from being aggressive. Um, and I, I think that that was a crucial moment where Golden State kept it close enough in the third quarter to the point where they seized the lead at the end of it on that Jordan Poole shot. And then the fourth quarter, they just ran away with it immediately. So uh, I, you, said, you said this 10 times, Sep, situational basketball. That's, that's situational basketball right now it, it, to a point. You're in the bonus. you got to attack. You, you no excuses you need to get, get to the free throw line more than two times and so that frustrated me but sap let's let's just just give our before we get out of here let's give our predictions for for game six um golden state has a chance to win their fourth title with this core um in boston are they going to do it or is it going to go to a game seven i'm usually wrong so i'm going to pick golden state to win in game in game six and secure the title i know they've already secured uh a sweet at uh, Encore Boston in Everett. But again, people are going to make a big deal out of that. Like, I can't believe they're, you know, setting up their victory party. Well, you have to do that. You can't just do that on a whim. You know, I'm sure the Celtics have a victory suite somewhere in San Francisco for Sunday night if they're able to win in game seven. But I just, I don't have a good feeling about this. But since I'm always wrong, plan on the Celtics winning and forcing game seven. So I'll pick Golden State to win uh, Thursday night at TD Garden and secure their championship. Uh, yeah, I hate to hear that, but, um, I, I, I do like that. You said that you're wrong. You know, I, I, I've picked at the beginning of the series, golden state and six, and here we are with golden state with the ability to win it in six. So, you know, how can I, how can I suddenly, re- it's not like the Celtics have given me good reason to reverse course on that right now. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say, stick with my original prediction, golden state and six, which means that they're going to be celebrating on the Boston garden floor. And I'm going to not be able to get that image burned out of my eyes um unfortunately the celtics absolutely can win it's not like wow they're facing this you know uh, this herculean task like i said at the beginning where they're just this is just how are they going to be able to pull this off we've seen it they've beaten gold state twice they they, they've had gold state on the ropes and not been able to to finish them off um in, in some games so they have the ability to win but i mean they gotta take the lessons that they've learned in these losses and apply them. Mm -hmm. And they have yet to do that in this series. So could this be a major turning point? Absolutely. Winning two games in a row is not something that the Celtics team is incapable of doing, uh, even against this golden state team. But right now, based off of how they're playing, what their body language looked like at the end of last game, the fact that, you know, Steph Curry is going to come back with a, a, a much better performance after he was not good, uh, in game five, all, all those signs point to Golden State. So uh, my original prediction of Golden State in six stands. I think the Warriors will be celebrating Boston, and I will be uh, I'll be very very unhappy. Sap. And the scare the the guy that scares the hell out of me is Clay Thompson because it seems like he owns Game Sixes, right? Going all the way That's back true. to when they were you know facing elimination in 2016 against Oklahoma City, and he had 37. I mean, he, he's really stepped up the last three games. 
to be a to be Clay Thompson. You know, we know what Steph Curry's all about, and then everybody else has kind of fit in. But again, hopefully we're wrong, Jet, and uh, you know we'll talk on Friday, win or lose, and hopefully we'll be discussing a Celtics victory and previewing Game Seven, which uh, doesn't happen very often in the NBA. The last time there was a NBA Finals that went to seven games was 2016 when Cleveland beat, by the way, Golden State in Game Six in the Bay Area. Yeah, Game Seven is I agree with you or a toss up. So uh, the Celtics just if they can if they can stave off elimination here they they'll put themselves in in a pretty damn good positions but they they cannot play like they have the you know the past two games they will not win that way uh, you know they have no chance of winning when you're turning the ball over that much against a team like Golden State um, so we will see what happens Sap hopefully I will not be very depressed the next time you hear me hopefully I'll be very happy and uh, but we will we will talk about it either way. So make sure you check out the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap wherever podcasts are found. Thanks to full press coverage. Check out our social medias at John Sap twenty five at Jet Stryer and the YouTube version is at YouTube.com/slash Jet Stryer. And we will talk to you after Game Six, everybody. See ya.